Well, welcome everybody, and, and thank you to Totley History Group for hosting uh, this t talk tonight. If you don't know, this talk is part of a whole series of events um, organised by um, a sort of impromptu organisation called Ruskin in Sheffield, celebrating John Ruskin and all his particular initiatives here, including St George's Museum in Walkley, which is now the Ruskin uh, collection in town, mm. and of course St George's Farm out here. But there's all sorts going on in Walkley, in Stannington, and indeed here, and in the middle of town, and indeed here in Totley. We've got this talk tonight, and um, on the 18th, on the 13th and 14th is a performance written by me uh, called uh, Boots, Fresh Air and Ginger Beer, which is a walking performance. We've only got about four tickets left. Uh, six, six tickets. Where's, where's that little voice come from? Oh, there she is. Six tickets for Sunday morning. But if you do miss out, we have got another um, event in October where, because we're going to film it, so we'll have that film and some uh, live performances. So do come, it'll be great fun. A few of the actors have turned up tonight <laughs> to do their own research. But um, I'm just going to tell you about uh, the structure of the evening. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Mark Frost who's Dr Mark Frost from the University of Portsmouth, who's written a new book called The Lost Companions, uh, much of which is devoted to uh, St George's Farm. And the research that he's done has certainly been amazingly helpful to me um, in terms of researching uh, for the performance, ably assisted over there by Dorothy Prosser. And uh, Mark's book has just been great. He's, he's uncovered a lot of new stuff by going to archives in the States. So we're delighted to have him here tonight. So Mark's going to talk to you. And then I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, some of the stuff, the sort of continuation of the story, if you like. Mark's going to go so far and then I'm going to carry on. And then after that, we're going to have a few questions. And after that, wonderful cake. I'm amazed by the cake, which is all through there. And uh, so do stuff yourselves silly. Um, anything else I need to say? All homemade. All homemade. All homemade. Uh, and it's great to see everybody tonight because I think, you know, there's a lot of you from Totley History Group, but there's other people I recognise from further afield and people I don't recognise at all. So there may be people here from Walkley because Walkley is incredibly busy, isn't it, at the moment, Ruth? This is Ruth in the front, who's the coordinator for all the events. So if you want to know anything, ask Ruth. She's fab. Um, so, um, yes, welcome to everybody. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark and uh, St George's Farm. Thank you. It really is lovely to be here. I take every opportunity to get up to the, the area. It was nice for Ruth to uh, badger me. Uh, so I'm here for a couple of talks this week. Obviously, I want to talk today about St George's Farm uh, near Totley. And on the one hand, it's a very local story, uh, but it is also an example of a much wider phenomenon of um, 19th century utopianism. Uh, there's an excellent book on the subject. Sorry, uh, um, Sally's going to ably help me with the slides. I should have nodded at that point. Um, Dennis Hardy um, traced hundreds of what we now call voluntary communities, groups who formed up into little organisations, communes and societies dedicated to pursuing their ideals. Uh, socialist communities, chartist villages, anarchist collectives, all of these things um, thrusting up into the 19th century. Religious groups awaiting millenarian judgment and those seeking salvation through spiritualism, occultism, theosophy, and, and rather scandalously, even free love. Many were reacting against Victorian economics, industrialisation and social norms. 
So when thinking about today's topic, that very local topic, we must remember that St George's Farm was only one manifestation of a very powerful tradition which was operating across the country and across the century. It is, however, uh, as a local story, one of the most fascinating examples of, of 19th century utopianism. And over the past six years, I've had a, a really wonderful good fortune to have been immersed in the history of one of the most interesting of those 19th century utopian organisations, uh, the Guild of St George, formed by the legendary uh, Victorian critic of art, culture and politics, John Ruskin, in 1871. Um, and as we see lo demonstrated locally through, through Ruth's leadership of this uh, wonderful Ruskin in Sheffield project, which is you know, reaching out to so many different uh, uh, community groups and organisations in the area, the, the Guild is still going strong. But one of the things that I found out in writing the book was just how horrendous the early years were, how very difficult they were. Uh, and these difficulties uh, in getting an organisation to function properly were particularly strongly felt at Totley. So, before we immense ourselves in the, in the events at Totley, uh, what I want to do, uh, first of all, is to outline how I ended up being engrossed in all of this um, in the first place, and I'll explain that briefly, and then I want to provide some background detail on Ruskin and the Guild, so we can see where Totley fits within the Guild itself. So a few years ago, back in 2009, I found myself in this enviable position um, by making an unexpected um, archival discovery. Um, I'd been invited to speak at Wellesley College, Massachusetts, which is a, a bizarre place. Sorry, next slide. Um, a bizarre um, place in Massachusetts. And I, I happened to visit the Ruskin collection that I didn't know anything much about. And, um, found some correspondence collected by one of Ruskin's collaborators. Um, after a fairly fruitless morning of, of not really finding very much, my attention suddenly alighted on a sheaf of handwritten papers on which were written an astonishing personal testimony of one man's experiences of life within the Guild of St George uh, down in Worcestershire at a place called Bewdley. And this was my entry into this kind of discoveries I've been making. And, and it's essentially the writings of one man's experiences of Guild life down in Bewdley in the 1870s and 1880s. And I was astonished by what I found out. Um, it was astonishing because I'd never known or heard of the writer. This is uh, just one of the pages of the, of the uh, initial discovery I made over in, in Massachusetts. And it was astonishing because I'd never heard of the uh, writer, William Buck and Graham. I'd been working on Ruskin for 15 years, read uh, an awful lot of material, and suddenly this figure pops up into the history of the Guild. Uh, I couldn't recall also any reference to agricultural work at Bewdley during the period that he was talking about. His name had just not cropped up, his work was unknown. Uh, and it was even more astonishing because the writer outlined a decade of misery endured as a result of joining Ruskin's crusade. So I furiously, I didn't have very long, I had to go back the next day, I spent the afternoon furiously transcribing these uh, letters, or what appeared to be a letter, um, and even had to be uh, allowed to stay in the archive archive 15 minutes after closing time because they you know, I had to capture this this piece of writing um, so th the, the writer William Graham is a young Glasgow idealist who had eagerly signed up for Ruskin's land work but found that he was treated uh, not kindly but like a factory hand he was paid less far less than the average agricultural worker received none of the training he had been promised and was later abandoned by the organization he had done so much to help and this sounded nothing like the guild that I'd read about. Um, and so with Graham's words ringing in my ears, I headed hastily back to the UK and spent a month looking at every conceivable scrap of, of Ruskin scholarship I could find to work out whether this really was some lost story or I'd stumbled down a blind alley. Um, I found nothing, no references to this, this person other than a few little uh, mentions of his name in membership lists. He gets mentioned once in a letter, but his story had just simply not been told. Um, Ruskin had repeatedly promised to create these idyllic ag agricultural estates all over the country, places for the members and companions of the Guild to work um, in building these, these ideal communities. Um, but Guild sources all outlining brief history of its land estates all suggested that Bewdley had simply not been worked until long after Graham had uh, left the area. 
Graham's name had cropped up briefly in a few documents, but his distressing story was simply unknown. Um, it was his testimony. It was one of the most moving things I'd written. It was a, a, a full-on uh, account of ten years of miserable life in, on on the land. Um, but after 125 years of Ruskin scholarship, we knew nothing about him. This seemed puzzling, to say the very least. So on the back of this discovery, I got a book contract and, and some funding. It allowed me to go back to Wellesley College to see what else was in the, the little volume. And so I spent three weeks coming up with some jaw-dropping new discoveries. Uh, spent an extensive amount of time travelling through the States and uh, UK, looking in archives, trying to find new materials to follow up the leads that kept on emerging. And I was staggered to find out uh, that Graham's tale of misery seemed to be valid, but also that it was matched by um, harrowing narratives from other guild estates, uh, and that Graham had headed a network of guild companions who were seeking compensation and justice for what had happened to them. And some of the, the uh, other uh, companions involved in this were, had worked at Totley. And so that le led me to start thinking about Totley as well. Um, this what appeared to me to have been a letter turned out to be uh, the draft of an article that he planned to publish, that Graham had planned to publish, in order to expose all of the things that had gone wrong, all of the ill treatment that he'd received in the Guild, and to highlight the other stories that um, um, were emerging from places like Totley. Worse still, I discovered that the publication of the article had been suppressed by leading guildsmen because the story was so damaging to Ruskin's reputation, and that their campaign to silence Graham and his article had been so successful that he'd essentially been buried for one and a quarter centuries until I happened to come across this little document. So, a bit of a discovery. In short, a massive and crucial part of the organisation's story, the story of the Guild of St George, had always been missing. Um, it turned out that there were several more missing chunks. And one of these, Totley, turned out to be the most complex, the most fascinating, the most difficult to make sense of. Uh, because the previous and uh, admittedly extensive coverage of Totley, I mean, you may well, uh, if you're interested in the subject, have read all kinds of things on Totley before. It's been fairly well covered. Turns out that, that an awful lot of that has just essentially been uh, either inaccurate or misleading uh, or just insufficient. There's an awful lot more to the Totley story than we'd ever realised. Working out what actually happened at Totley was not like placing a few missing pieces in an already existing jigsaw puzzle. It was like getting several jigsaw uh, sets of jigsaws thrown together on the floor and trying to make out what on earth is going on. Um, I, in order to describe the picture that I've come up with, this, this attempp to solve the jigsaw puzzle at Tot Totley, uh, I need to first of all provide a couple of uh, frameworks for you. The first of all, uh, by thinking about Ruskin and explaining a little bit more about the Guild. So if we start with Ruskin, we'll put the next slide on. Sorry, next one. Um, one of the things it's hardest to do today, I think, is to communicate just how towering Ruskin's status was within the Victorian period, the towering status within Victoria culture, the impact on, he made on so many of the debates of the period. Without any formal training in art history, he managed to become uh, the... The, the foremost uh, and influential art critic of his day, perhaps the most important British art, art critic of all time. Uh, an art critic arguing in the midst of Victorian industrialisation that appreciation of beauty is the key to everything, that appreciation of beauty leads to devotion to God, but also to care of each other and to care of the environment. Having uh, established himself as an art critic, he turned to architecture, another subject in which he had absolutely no training, and quickly became its most prominent voice. Um, and he's important in, in the development of his ideas that he moves from art through architecture to politics. In terms of architecture, in studies of Venetian Gothic architecture, he argued that a nation's moral temperature can essentially be uh, measured by looking at its art and its buildings. Um, a debased, uh, decadent society like Renaissance Venice or Victorian Britain, in his opinion, um, such societies produce debased art and terrible buildings. Um, reverent societies produce organic, beautiful, devotional art and fantastic buildings. It's, it's a measure 
that we can all take of the world around us and the society we're in, Ruskin argues, by just simply looking at, at the artefacts that we create. Finding the ethical condition of his own society wanting, he sought to establish um, or re-establish medieval work practices and to attack machine manufacture, clearly an important issue at, at this moment in time. All of this led him into politics uh, and to arguments that the role of the, it was the role of the state to provide conditions for cooperative, creative work and to produce goods and services that led to health and social betterment. Wealth, he argued, could only be wealth if it was used for good. Useless, shoddy or harmful goods produced for profit and in conditions that maimed or brutalised workers could only generate the opposite of wealth. And he came up with a word for this, for the opposite of wealth, ilf. <laughs> it's a, one of those, those moments of genius that Ruskin comes up with. Um, merchants, manufacturers and politicians who worship what he called Britannia of the market or the goddess of getting on failed in their divinely appointed leadership roles, he thundered, and were working for the devil. So in a series of scathing assaults on utilitarian economics, um, he, he continued continue with this in the 1860s and 1870s, initially scorned, but he gradually inspired generations of radicals uh, of all kinds, uh, socialists, anarchists, Marxists, liberals, um, all kinds of people. He, he was a chief inspiration of Gandhi's, uh, of all people. His reform proposals influenced Britain's mo modern welfare state, uh, Beveridge in particular. Um, but his political position is complicated and it, it's not always uh, easy to categorise him in terms of, of our usual understanding of left and right politics. Um, his collected works are complex, varied, they're twice as long as the Bible. You can read whatever you like into Ruskin in the same way that you can read whatever you like in, in the Bible. But while, while his works are massive, complex um, and varied, they all suggest that the first task of humans is to appreciate uh, and to value beauty. That it all comes down in the end to this. Once we do so, we may become moral, productive individuals driven to protect each other, to look after society, to protect the sources of beauty in the natural and built environments and in the individuals and groups who strive to create it. If we don't have that feeling for beauty, then we, our acts and our, our relationships will not be beautiful. Um, Ruskin's practical social interventions, there were many, were largely calamitous, but he did believe passionately in reform. Um, his critiques of, of Victorian society were incredibly powerful and, and I would suggest that they remain relevant today in, in many of the things that he says. But I want to add, and it's really a re really important caution whenever we talk about Ruskin, that, that while Ruskin inspired socialists, he was a Tory radical, critical of democracy. He couldn't, had no time for democracy, refused to vote himself. He was critical of communism, critical of trade unions, critical of the working classes in many uh, cases, but at the same time he was inspired to try and help the working classes. He's a deeply contradictory figure. Um, he called for a benevolent dictatorship of wise leaders and obedient subjects. Um, the, the, the politics are a kind of contradictory mixture of savage radicalism, really powerful and potent attacks on the ills of his own society, some wonderful ideas for change, but also intense conservatism. And it was this conservatism, I think, more than anything else, that condemned his social projects to failure. That, that meant that his ideas couldn't quite be translated into action. So this kind of brings us to the Gilda St George. You want the next slide? <coughs> the Gilda St George Ruskin's most direct attempt to put his ideals into practice. Um, by 1871, he'd essentially tired of talking about reform endlessly in speeches, lectures and in books. And he wanted to do something about it. So he announced a national fund, the, the St George's Fund, through which contributors might challenge Victorian society by the buying and securing of land in England which shall not be built upon but cultivated by Englishmen with their own hands and such help of force as they can find in wind and wave. Wind and wave, not coal uh, and steam. Wind and wave and human, human energy. The Guild attempted to engineer an alternative society that would manoeuvre between the perceived evils of unrestrained capitalism and revolutionary politics. 
these campaigning years demonstrating the extremes of Ruskin's character and politics uh, reflected his idiosyncratically Tory response to modernity. Led by Ruskin, its members or companions hoped to offer a practical alternative to Victorian economics, a new way of doing things, he said. Um, to revalue labour, the individual and the earth by establishing agricultural and artisanal communities supported by schools, museums and libraries. Um, there's this wonderful vision of these communities surrounded by these kind of cultural um, edifices. In terms of, of projects, there were agricultural projects, educational projects and uh, industrial projects. The educational projects primarily connected, of course, to the Sheffield Museum, uh, which I'm going to be talking about in Walkley on Friday. Its industrial projects, which are less well known, included a publishing company, which was very successful. George Allen & Co. went on to inspire the Net Book Agreement. It was a very interesting publishing experiment. Uh, it also, uh, Guild projects included a woolen mill, linen industry, a cooperative mill in Huddersfield, all kinds of little projects of interest going on ara around the place. Agricultural activities centred on land purchases or donations at Barmouth in, New in North Wales, in Bewdley in Worcestershire, Totley locally and Clouton Moor over towards Harrogate. The organisation of course never in his lifetime lived up to Ruskin's grand hopes. We hope we're doing a little better these days. Um, in, under Ruskin's stewardship, it never failed to attract a wide membership. There were perhaps 80 members by the time he died. Uh, and it was an organisation hamstrung by its leaders' faulty politics, by its authoritarian management, by Ruskin's own emotional traumas and his ill health. An awful lot of things went wrong um, in the 15 years that Ruskin was trying to put all this together. So what did the organisation look like? If you want to put the next one on. There's a very clear hierarchy. Ruskin organised his companions into feudal ranks, essentially. At the top, the master, Ruskin, could be dismissed by majority rule, but once he was in power, he, could be, he was unchallenged in any of his decisions. He was an absolute autocrat while in power. Uh, the companions servant, these were very Latin terms, uh, essentially, they were to be devoted to administration and oversight of community life. One of the problems was Ruskin didn't find enough people to fill this with trustworthy people. Um, subject to their absolute rule and the people who interest me most were the companions militant. These are the people who do the actual work, uh, agricultural, uh, agriculturalists, artisans. Um, beneath them, in theory at least, were the companions consular, uh, people who joined the guild but remained in mainstream society. They didn't join any of the estates or, or do any of the direct work. So this kind of hierarchy is not entirely strictly enforced, but within the organisation, the principle of hierarchy and authority are, was depressingly active. Most members had little involvement in guild schemes. Uh, even though many of them wanted to be, while local project leaders were often unscrupulous and untrustworthy in their dealings. The problem at this level of the companions servant, who were meant to make sure that everything worked and that everyone was looked after. Although small in number, the labouring companions, these companions militant, were more significant, I've been discovering, than anyone had imagined. Uh, and while they were consistently subordinated and squashed within the organisation, they resisted the Guild's leadership class and provided um, a compelling critique of Ruskin's ideology. They were a form of resistance to the way that the Guild was set up. And these are the lost companions, the companions militant. Um, they're at the heart of my revision of Guild history, the thing that went into my book. Um, and what I've done, hopefully, is, is to unleash their voices. Instead of having a singular account of the Guild, which is largely refracted through Ruskin and a few others, I've thrown up a whole load of these voices of people who haven't really got to be heard uh, and who deserve, in my opinion, to be heard. Um, because the Sheffield Museum, the subject of a talk I'll uh, give on Friday, became the Guild's most successful enterprise, the Guild is often seen as a predominantly educational organisation, but from the beginning, Ruskin insisted that it should be an agricultural organisation, that everything um, should fulfil the Guild's sa central sacred task, which was feeding human lips, clothing human bodies, kindling human souls. Uh, land was absolutely essential 
for the uh, ennobling effects of, of, um, of, of working the land. Um, do you want to just put the next slide on? So the idea was they'd purchase the land or they'd, they'd uh, have donations and then once this happened, Ruskin promised, we will ascertain the absolute best that can be made of every acre. We will first examine what flowers and herbs it naturally bears. Every wholesome flower that it will grow shall be grown in its wild places and every kind of fruit tree that can prosper uh, and arable and pasture land extended by every expedient of tillage with humble and simple cottage dwellings under faultless sanitary regulation. <laughs> okay, so he's setting himself up for quite a, quite a high bar here. Because <coughs> he carried away by such visions, he envisaged a level, level of support that never actually materialised. He said, the labourers shall, this is the plan, the labourers shall be paid sufficient unchanging wages and their children educated compulsorily in agricultural schools, in land and naval schools by the sea. The indispensable first conditions of such education being that the boys learn either to ride or to sail. You can see this kind of old fashioned Tory vision coming in here. The girls, you'll be content to spin, <coughs> weave and sew, and at a proper age to cook all ordinary food exquisitely. <laughs> and for morality to be taught gentleness to all brute creatures, which is good, finish courtesy to each other, to speak truth with rigid care, and then we get the troubling bit, and to obey orders with the precision of slaves. <laughs> For, uh, we'll come to that. Uh, Ruskin, essentially. Uh, despite the reference to slave-like adherence, many working class readers, enchanted by these visions of, of good air, healthy exercise, honourable labour, sanitary regulation, you know, all these kind of things, offered themselves as pioneers, quite understandably. Ruskin's statement seemed like a promise from a trustworthy friend who assured them of his ability to guide them in thought and deed. Um, the powerful effect of Ruskin's prose, and he, he wrote a series of monthly letters to the working men of England through which he um, communicated these plans, and they, they picked up copies, borrowed copies, read these things as much as they could. Um, the powerful effect of Ruskin's prose on those who were used to long, tedious urban labour in places like Glasgow cannot be underestimated. But those who answered the call found labour on, on the Guild's estate nothing like these uh, bewitching pastoral visions. The Sheffield Museum is kind of gives us a way into Totley. It provided a, a superb educational resource for Sheffield's workers and is intimately connected to the story of uh, St George's Farm via its curator Henry Swan, uh, a wonderful man who became Totley's main encourager. The project, which Ruskin referred to as Abbeydale, because he preferred the sound of the name, has been widely used as a case study of the organisation's failing agricultural work. But while this is true, it certainly was in many ways a failure, the experiment has produced confused critical coverage. We haven't quite got totally right. Scholars have over-relied essentially on W.H.G. Armitage's chapter on the project in his 1961 survey of English utopianism. It's a good source, but while it's influential, it's also incomplete and uh, inaccurate. The reasons for Totley's failure, the dating of events, this, this description of the development of the various phases, the role played by key actors have been only partially understood by Armitage and others. Up until now, we've not even known the names of most of the Totley activists, realised just how many people were involved or accessed the perspective of William Harrison Riley, the estate's most villi vilified figure. Um, so, the way I've, way I've managed to, to, to carry on and, and build on this and challenge some of the, the previous coverage and show, show the problems is to go to a number of neglected or misunderstood sources that have helped to provide more clarity on all of this. Um, Philadelphia's Rosenbach Museum holds ten volumes of Ruskin's correspondence to Hen Henry and El Emily Swan. Uh, it's been sitting there since the 1950s, but it's barely been looked at by Ruskin scholars, which was a big surprise to me. I was able to go in and just, you know, read this enormous uh, source for the first time. Um, it provides invaluable detail on the museum, but also invaluable detail on Totley. It, it, it nails a number of key issues in relation to Totley. Um, 1889 editions of William Morris's socialist newspaper, Commonweal, 
uh, feature contributions from a number of those keen to relate their involvement at Totley. They're useful sources, provocative, difficult sources. Uh, but also the papers of um, William Harrison Riley have not been looked at before. They're at Yale, which makes it difficult to get to them. Uh, but his papers at, at uh, Yale and uh, some of his letters at Wellesley College, which I discovered, provide much information on his involvement in the scheme, while a document from Hull History Centre provides vital clarification about the early participants. Um, trying to make sense of all of this requires us to reassess who was involved at Totley, what happened on the ground, why the project foundered during its three distinct phases. Um, I'm going to try and go through them now, the, the three phases, as briefly as, as, as I can. And I know Sally's also got some very interesting discoveries that, that she's been following up on that we can talk about afterwards. But I'm just going to go through these various phases. The first was connected to a group of Sheffield radicals who called themselves communists and formed, them, formed themselves into the United Friends Association. The second was led by William Harrison Riley, who's a really interesting figure and Ruskin's gardener, David Downs, who's even more interesting in many ways. And the third was under Downs' solo stewardship. Um, by the late 1880s, we move out of the period that I'm interested in. The farm was transferred to Edward Furness and George Pearson, very competent communists who ensured that the estate finally became productive outside guild control. So, into the first phase. Who was involved? We don't yet have a complete list of names, we think, and Sally and Dorothy are doing sterling work in trying to put this right, but a remarkable legal document has been hiding in plain sight at Hull for goodness knows how long, and it provides for the first time the names of the signatories here of a memorandum of agreement with Ruskin in which they promise within seven years to pay to John Ruskin the sum of £50 each, um, or in default, the United Friends Association, Parker House, Abbeydale, Totley, Derbyshire, of which we are members, will undertake the responsibility of any one of us who may be un unable to fulfil his promise. So we have names at last. We had a couple of these were already known, but the full list was, was only discovered recently. <coughs> and they're generally, as far as we can see, and again, I've consulted somewhat with Sally in trying to nail this, they're generally older men from skilled trades, um, these signatories formed a cooperative that included many wives as well and uh, other unnamed supporters. Following Armitage, many have assumed that the leader of this group was William Harrison Riley, uh, but the Hull and Rosenbach sources confirmed that it was Edwin Priest. Edwin Pri Priest is the chief mover in this early phase, not William Harrison Riley. It's also been thought that the communists were predominantly bootmakers. Uh, and that they planned to till the land and manufacture shoes. But I found no good evidence for this. Sally might have found some better evidence, but we, we can talk about that later. And if further research is into the individuals named, um, I think Sally and, and myself agree that this early aspiration was probably never pursued. Um, but one of the things that, that people tend to associate with Totley is the idea of boot making. So one of the interesting questions is why this confusion arose. Early members included a building society director, a, for, uh, a fork maker, a stove fitter, an optician, a surgical instrument maker, a labourer and an engineer. But while bootmakers appear on the fringes of the group, it's not clear that they were directly involved. So we've got some very loose sense of the personnel. We need to think about their aspirations, why they describe themselves as communists and how they ended up being connected to Ruskin. One of the, the richest and most useful documents about the early years is uh, provided in a letter to Commonweal by the wonderfully feisty Mrs. Malloy, one of the original group, or the husband of, of John Malloy, uh, wife uh, of John Malloy. Uh, she describes the development of the group, who in 1874 began to attend, attend a mutual improvement class at the Hall of Science in Rockingham Street. To the next slide. Uh, there was a sense of a wonderfully energetic local group in Sheffield. Their activities were part of, of the city's fine educational and radical uh, movement at the time, and it led to a self-confident democratic spirit. And she wrote, Each member took their turn to write a paper on any subject the writer chose and read it before the class who were expected to discuss the merits of the paper. When the class judged them good enough, they would afterwards be read before the public who patronised the hall on Sunday evenings. 
about July or August of the year 1875, a member read a paper advocating communism and it created much interest and some excitement. A few of us formed a society to propagate communist views, our ultimate object being to live the life of communists. Now for this group, as far as I can tell, communism really means communalism and involved buying or leasing some land on which to erect suitable buildings both for dwelling and business purposes. That was their aim. Um, Jan Marsh, writing about 19th century utopianism, suggests that their aspirations should be located in an anti-industrial tradition in which going back to the land meant a deeper sense of returning to cultivation, to agrarian life and a closer, intimate relationship with the earth. Hardy suggests that Totley was nourished by a vague but persisting recollection, recollection of a past golden age, a garden of Eden, of material abundance and natural beauty. But I haven't really found much evidence for these aspirations amongst the, uh, the Totley communists. A sense of recuperation of the essential recovery of land that might otherwise be lost as a result of the consuming greed of industrial capitalism was central to the Guild's aims, as Stuart Eagles here has pointed out. Uh, but it's not clear that this was a concern of the communists themselves. It's not clear that they see themselves as some kind of pastoralists inspired by romantic ideas. The, idea, the ideologies of Ruskin, who certainly fits into this category, and the Sheffielders were in fact markedly misaligned. But their fateful alliance with Ruskin was taken in full knowledge of his authoritarianism. This meant departure from the fierce self-reliance that initially sustained them. Speaking of the early years, Malloy recalled that they planned to wait for their funds to accrue and did not, seek, uh, did not intend to seek any rich man's aid. They wanted to remain independent. Inspired and ambition, there was not one doubter in our ranks and we had, I believe, perfect trust in each other in these early days. This changed drastically during the following two years. So the group made contact with Ruskin in 1875 via Henry Swan, a friend of priests, but their initial meeting only underlined their ideological differences. Ruskin's diary recorded that the meeting left him somewhat wearied in gloomy wreck of sunset. So obviously hadn't pleased him very much. While Malloy noted that we knew that Mr Ruskin believed that one man should rule absolutely and all others should unquestionably obey, but as they did not believe this, nor did we believe in taking the vow which was required in order to become members of the St George's Guild, they did not at this time fall in with the curator's suggestion, she tells us. So it's, it's clear from the off that their, their, their politics are quite different. However, Swan, who, who's described rather tersely by Malloy as a persevering man, kept pestering them and sought to overcome the need to join the need for them to join the guild by leaving the uh, by proposing that Mr Ruskin should lend the money to purchase land leaving the communists free to manage their own affairs however they wanted invited by Ruskin to look for land they selected a farm between 13 and 14 acres at uh, Doran Totley and she then describes what what she believes the arrangement with Ruskin entailed he then required each male member of the community to undertake to pay his share of the capital back to him without interest and every man gave him his promise in writing to do so. So that in seven years the whole was to be paid back to Mr Ruskin and the farm would then have been ours. Meantime, Mr Ruskin was owner. So Malloy is under the impression that the £50 each that they're putting into this somehow at the end of the day will lead them to owning the farm. But in fact, Ruskin paid 2287 pounds for this so it's clear they've got something up the 450 pounds they've agreed to pay it's a fraction of that purchase cost um, and we know that Ruskin refers to their payments as rent um, so there's the, right from the off there's a kind of misunderstanding about the whole project they think they're essentially buying the farm over a period of time whereas it appears that they were in fact renting it and we see the first signs of the group beginning to become divided uh, as soon as they accept this offer from, from uh, Ruskin at the behest of Henry Swan. So, following the, a flurry of early activity, Ruskin uh, began a nine-month continental trip in August 1876. If you think of fortnight, uh, holiday is nice. Nine-month continental trip uh, in August 1876. He was working, but, you know... Uh, all the same, while abroad, he kept in, in touch with the Swans and the Communists and was closely involved in Totley's development. He was incredibly supportive, in fact. 
By December, the land purchase was underway and by New Year's Eve, Ruskin excitedly reported that he had no doubt of our being led as a body of fellow workers into the knowledge of such things as hitherto have not been seen in Gentile hands. This, he clearly believed, was a significant moment in the Guild's development. He invested a lot in, in Totley's success, both financially and emotionally, um, but only disappointment would, res would result from a project in which he invested so much energy. In June 1877, um, made his first public announcement of the scheme. A few of the Sheffield working men who admit the possibility of St George's notions being just, he, he wrote, have asked me to let them rent some ground from the company whereupon to spend what spare hours they have of morning or evening in useful labour. I have no knowledge yet of the men's plans and details, nor shall I much interfere with them until I see how they develop themselves. But here is at last a little piece of England given into the English workman's hand and heavens. So it's this wonderfully joyful moment of beginning. Um, Ruskin essentially envisaged that he'd fund the project but not lead it, that the men would, uh, the, the, he acknowledged the friend's independence, offered some advice, but hoped that progress would occur once the men had uh, abandoned their own radicalism uh, and come to perceive that the truth is with us. Ruskin's pronouncements on the project suggested widely diverging visions about the estate. He advised them to appoint a simple and orderly tyrant. <laughs> but because they were not guild members, asked only for compliance with certain of St George's laws and that they manufacture these boots according to Ruskinian principles. No shoes were made and the communists were not the men he had conjured in his mind. Ruskin believed they were called into a Christian ship of war and told them that the simple question for each one of you every day will be not how he and his family are to live, for your bread and water will be sure, but how much good service you can do to your country. <coughs> the United Friends, in the, in the meantime, had other ideas. Having believed that it would be years before their dreams were fulfilled, the soon-to-be disunited Friends suddenly faced new responsibilities, and as Malloy admitted, their first act was to refuse to move onto the site. None of our parties, she points out, were farmers and all were earning money at their trades. I mean, this is a, a difficulty that many people face who have that, that desire to move to the land. You know, it's a break, isn't it? So we engaged instead a practical man as a working manager, paying him 24 shillings per week and letting him live in the house rent free. So there's an early compromise. Malloy's practical man was a Mr Shaw, I've discovered, and it was he who managed the estate on the back of Ruskin's generous funding. Ruskin put a lot of seed money into this. <laughs> Their eagerness to live communistically having waved, wavered, the United Friends essentially compromised, remaining in Sheffield and becoming urba urban travellers uh, to the rural idyll. She says, a few more joined us about this time and another man was engaged to work on the farm. We excited much curiosity. Many visitors went to the farm and newspaper correspondents had some things to say about us, wise and otherwise. Now our expenses were increased and we had to meet them, so we had parties to visit ju us during the summer, taking tea, for which we charged. Another woman member and myself found our hens very full at this time, for between us we prepared all the teas and sold eggs and fruit, doing all we could to add to the income. Every Wednesday we went to Dora and Totley from Sheffield, bringing back fruit, eggs and vegetables to the meetings, which the members purchased, paying ready money at f and full value. <coughs> so neither a shoemaking venture nor a uh, hands-on communistic experiment, the first phase of Totley seems to me to have rested as much on the rather modern idea of marketing an idea of smallholding life um, as selling its products. Despite the costs of employing Shaw and others though, Totley seemed financially viable and ran into trouble only because of divergent visions of the future. I think they could have made something of this. Several things got in the way. James Burden, uh, a companion of the Guild of St George, who was shipped in essentially, he's, he's from Perth, uh, offered a depressing account of the farm. He, he came in to, to do a little bit of work on the farm for a period. said, uh, the persons who employed me at Sheffield were a small group of townspeople who had formed themselves into a communistic body with Mr Swan. None of them were acquainted with agricultural work. I stayed there a few months, but I was very little, of very little use to them. I was left entirely to myself. 
Uh, William Graham, who I started with, he also worked there for a short period before moving to Bewdley, but his only memories were of not being properly paid. He didn't seem to have met anyone uh, of the, the original communists. And it, this is a real shame. I think the arrival of people like Burden and Graham, these, these committed idealists from elsewhere in the country, represented an unexploited opportunity for class solidarity at Totley, for something to have been built there. Um, but the project's first phase dis disintegrated very, very quickly, within a year of a starting. Why did it, get, why did it, why did it break up? Well, there were signs of dis discontent that emerged in uh, July 1877, when Ruskin told Swan that, I expect nothing but row and disappointment from the men themselves, and described Totley as mere chemical experiments on Sheffield stuff. <laughs> by no November, he told his readers that he was greatly concerned by the difficulties which naturally present themselves in the first organisation of work at Abbeydale, the more that these are for the most part attributable to very little and very ridiculous things. Blaming his own absence in Venice for the men's heinous decision to get on by vote of the majority, he claimed satisfaction that they have entirely convinced themselves of the impossibility of getting on in that popular manner. It's easy, easy to understand Ruskin's impatience, I think, at this point. He'd remained in touch from abroad, postponed rent demands, responded to appeals for funds, the communists in return, it seems, bickered, made poor decisions, wasted their opportunities and fell out amongst themselves. And we only have really one version of, of, of events for why this, this fallout happened. Malloy, who's not the, necessarily the most reliable person, but we don't have anything else. Malloy suggested that the Friends became fatally disunited after Edwin Priest, their supposed leader, wrote to Mr Ruskin and received from him, in reply, a cheque for £100, which he cashed. On seeing the money, the committee at once passed a vote of censure on him and requested our president to write to Mr Ruskin returning the money, but found he would not take it back. Priest's aim, it seems, had been from the first to live with his family on the farm, and he impatiently began to press upon the society to let him take his work there. The £100, it seems, was that there to be more seed money so that... Edwin Priest could move in and, and try and make the estate work. Um, the society, however, was supposed to, you know, his, his fellow members of the group were supposed to take his, uh, look after his business while he, while he went off to, the, to Totley to, to live on the farm. Refused consent by the others, he was much disappointed and very unreasonable. And according to Malloy, at least, he chose to consult in secret with this villainous figure, William Harrison Riley, who had no connection of any sort with us, Malloy says nor was he even friendlily disposed to us. So the, the group seems at this point to shatter among, between Priest, who wants to, to move more radically onto the land, uh, and the rest of them, who are quite happy with the arrangement. Riley, she alleged, went to the farm and took absolute possession of everything. She thinks this is in connivance with Edwin Priest and told our manager, Mr Shaw, that he was master. So according to Malloy, a kind of coup has taken place. Suddenly they're dispossessed of the farm. William Harrison Riley has turned up. Um, and they believe this was impossible because the society they thought had agreed to pay Ruskin back this, this uh, pay, pay Ruskin the money for the farm. Mr Riley, however, coolly informed them that he was master there and that they had no power and met their remonstrances with sneers and in one case with threats of personal violence. <coughs> After Ruskin ignored their letters, they wrote to him to ask what the hell you know, was going on. The committee then declined all further responsibility or connection with the farm. Malloy was outraged, the group had gone, but Ruskin had clearly lost patience with them. He seems to have lost patience very, very quickly. Malloy's account can't be independently verified, and Riley's papers provide a very different uh, version of events with while the early Commonweal letters led critics to think that Riley was one of the United Friends, he only moved to Sheffield in 1877 and insisted that I never attended any of their meetings and was not responsible for their shortcomings. Um, he was the person, he said, who was uh, appointed by Ruskin to check that they were um, behaving and that, uh, and that he found that most, if not all, of its members were honest and earnest. And Riley has always played a traditional role in all of the accounts of Totley as this kind of cardboard, cut-out, villainous figure um, who made everything went wrong. The Riley we know from sources like Armitage um, 
was an unstable, a stereotypically unstable left-wing firebrand, a sneering tyrant who disappeared abroad at the first sign of hard work. He dispossessed the others of the farm, and then as soon as it looked like he had to do hard work, he disappeared himself. This is the, the figure we've, we've seen. But the Riley we've encountered, or that I've encountered through his extensive correspondence, is, is far more nuanced, more interesting, more substantial. He doesn't read the same as this figure we've always um, heard about in other accounts. Um, whatever the truth of Riley's takeover at Totley, his motivations were rooted in an impassioned desire to see paradise on earth. And that's why he steps in and takes over this second phase at Totley. He's a Christian socialist, a temperance enthusiast, a member of Marx's Internationale, someone who's been editor of many short-lived um, radical papers. And what, the thing that he'd always wanted to do is to found socialist villages. And he thinks he's found uh, essentially a way to do this. In 1872, so a few years before Totley gets under, underway, five years before Riley makes it to Sheffield, he starts writing to Ruskin, hoping that, that Ruskin's fame and money would help him to support these socialist village ideas that he's got. Uh, and we see from the letters that they're kind of drawn to each other, but their, their, their politics are wildly divergent and their letters show them circling warily around each other for years, not quite trusting each other. So Riley is known to Ruskin, he turns up in 1877, this group is, is starting to fall apart and he seems to manage to insert himself into the uh, history of the farm at exactly this point. Uh, and this is despite the fact that around this time Ruskin tells Swan that I believe Riley to be half mad. <laughs> he would certainly make me wholly so if I had more to do with him. So, Riley is someone who can really rub people up the wrong way, but he remains in Sheffield and, and somehow a uh, kind of reconciliation with Ruskin happens. Uh, and in January 1878, suddenly Riley is the person in, in charge of the farm. However difficult Riley could be, Ruskin seemed to see something that merited patience and, and he stepped into this breach opened up by the incompetence of the United Friends. The communist plans had kept changing in, in baffling ways. Uh, Ruskin had become fed up with all of this and uh, was ready for a change. He was particularly frustrated with Swan, whose uh, encouragement of the scheme and of the various members um, had, had led him in this direction. So Riley's entries into Ruskin's Totley plans was an, as a known, if sometimes disquieting, quantity. Um, Riley doesn't deny these claims by Malloy of uh, the accounts of threats of violence and sneering towards the communists when they turned up at the farm, but he clearly initiated the change of authority. In February 1878, a month after indicating that the Sheffielders would be given a year to sort themselves out, he thought, Ruskin thought, you've got one more year. Very, very quickly, a month later, he changes his mind. Uh, he tells Swan that I have a letter from Riley which I like and am prepared to comply with if you concur with me in thinking it advisable. I do not think St George's money wasted in these experiments so long as I am able to find men of whom I am sure. Every trial will teach us something. I do not like having to advance money again but cannot see how the poor fellow can start without it. So whatever Riley did or said during that stormy confrontation with the communists, um, it was in the formal capacity of Ruskin's retainer. It was with Ruskin's full approval that he took over the farm. And Riley claims to have christened the estate. He's the one who came up with the name uh, St George's Farm, he says. He sent letters from that address throughout the period he was there. The family were on site by May 1878, the Riley family, uh, and Riley wrote to an unnamed friend of his happiness and hopes. And one of the nice things that, uh, about the, the various discoveries I've made is finding out more about this period when, when William Harrison Riley uh, was on the farm. Next one. Uh, sorry, next one. Uh, and again. Um, there you go. No, oh, no, and again. Sorry, I've been ignoring my prompts. There you go. It's the second quotation here. Um, it's just this lovely image of, of William Harrison Riley first in the farm his early, early experiences. He says, um, I, have, I have opportunities of writing a little when I'm not too tired, but I expect to have more opportunity and even, even hope some means may turn up to enable me to resume my organising work. So as soon as he's in the farm, he's already thinking about these kind of radical projects to, to start a newspaper and, and um, 
start socialist villages. But I cannot do this at all effectively without a paper, he says. And therefore, I am always anxious to obtain means to issue a paper. Meantime, I wait and have a livelihood. As for our living, it's an honest one. And had I no ambition, it would suffice. So like many subsequent radicals, Riley, Riley sought an idealistic life on the land in which body and intellect were to be equally exercised. He aspired to do good on his own terms rather than merely submitting to Ruskin's vision. He, he's clearly not, not in uh, keeping with Ruskin's vision of, of authoritarian leaders and, and obedient subjects. Uh, but at the same time, he relished the farm work. I mend a wall. Grind off file tools, spread, muck, dick, dig, hoe, or wheel stones with satisfaction. Indeed, I'm proud of my work and feel much inclined to show off over much when I go to town in my hobnails. This is a lovely <coughs> image. Uh, not the first or last land revolutionary, Riley. This is Riley here, by the way. Um, Riley's chief de demerit for his enemies amongst the guild was that he had a mind of his own. So he was supported by new funds, made a good start, they kept poultry and a pony, they were getting a, a, a crop of hay cut. During this halcyon period, Riley appears to have invited others to live on the farm. And we have fellow travellers like Edward Carpenter who drop in to lend a hand. Uh, Carpenter used Totley as a cautionary example in crafting his own semi-communal experiment at nearby Millthorpe. But by August 1878, Ruskin's solo stewardship ended as a result of an unexpected announcement uh, that Ruskin made to Swan that his own gardener, David Downs, would become the farm manager or agent. It all seemed to be going so well, and then suddenly we have this change of organisation within quite a short time. Um, can you just see if the next slide is the right one? Yeah. And this is Ruskin writing to Henry Swan, suddenly announcing that, that uh, William Harrison Riley, who thought he was happily sitting there in charge of the farm, was going to have a new boss. Um, as the only way possible now uh, to me of letting any touch of my bridal hand uh, be still felt, uh, Sheffield ways, is to send down to you my faithful old gardener and lately steward. I mean him to live for a while at least at Abbeydale, whence he can make little flying visits to me and ask me a question or two, and in all matters respecting the management of the land, he is to have whatever authority I could have myself if I were there, and deserves it much better, seeing he knows much more about the business and understands my mind. So this is where we um, suddenly have the entry of this uh, figure, David Downs, Ruskin's gardener, on the scene. And it's an odd move, and, and clearly something that, that um, Riley um, detests. Ruskin's faith in, in Downs as his, his uh, obedient gardener is very much misplaced. The decision he makes to, to bring Downs here is disastrous. Uh, and it, it, it's not clear why. It also essentially uh, heralds the end of the whole project uh, over time. Um, Ruskin certainly paid no heed to, Rus to Riley's likely reaction to his sudden demotion. Um, in 1889, at the prompting of William Graham, so you go to the next slide. Uh, we get Riley's record of uh, his version of events um, written as, uh, as part of the campaign to, for, for justice. And he, this is how he describes it. Mr Ruskin agreed in writing to rent to me and several specified associates part of the Totley estate and to lend us a specified sum of money for use on the estate. Two, he failed to keep his agreement, but sent to manage the estate a man who detested the guild. This is David Downs. This is his account of David Downs, the man who detested the guild. Three, <coughs> a pro tem arrangement was made with me through the agent. The agent is Downs. I was to work at the place at one pound a week. So instead of being charged, he's suddenly working there at one pound a week. When I reminded the agent of my agreement with Ruskin, he shrugged his shoulders, shook his head. But, said I, Ruskin will keep his word. The agent gave an incredulous shrug and said he knew nothing about it. Four, the agent's acts were in harmony with his enmity to the Guild and he made it utterly impossible for me to be loyal to both him and the Guild. Ultimately, my loyalty to the Guild was represented by him as insubordination. So you can see the sense of tension that's building up here. Now, Riley's version of events is provocative and it casts light on a period of the Totley experiment about which we've known absolutely nothing. 
Critics have always thought that Downs is essentially parachuted in right at the end of the phase because everyone has gone away. Riley's disappeared, the United Friends are gone, there's no one there, let's put David Downs in. But he's there for much longer and he's there at the same time as William Harrison Riley, which we hadn't realised. And this is a problem because they detested one another. They coexisted on the property for a year, uh, frictions between them mounted very quickly. Riley came up with a, what he called a very incomplete list of grievances in George at Totley. And this was to form one plank of uh, William Graham's expose of, of Guild Life, that article I talked about right at the beginning. And, and uh, Riley's account includes many uh, complaints about uh, Downs. Um, go to the next slide. His response is also balanced by sympathy for, for what he sees an, uh, as an old fashioned conservative uh, retainer. This is a lovely description. Downs was a great beer drinker and was seldom completely sober whilst at Totley. He highly praised Ruskin's father, whom he had served as gardener, but as we have heard him say, he hated Ruskin from the bottom of my heart. But I consider Paul Downs was one of Ruskin's victims. He was honest in his disbelief in the Guild and thought his master would benefit by its failure. He, all thought, uh, he also thought he would benefit, and hence, being a very selfish man, he schemed to cause the failure as far as he could. We've got this, this uh, Riley, who's always been painted as the villain, is now giving us another villain to work with here. Um, there are plenty of reasons, in fact, to believe Ruskin, uh, R Riley's account. Uh, we get kind of corroborating evidence. Over the past decade, the ageing Downs, who would probably hope to be sinking sedately into semi-retirement at Brantwood, Ruskin's home, have been sent by Ruskin around the country to help in a series of Guild projects, all of which failed. Riley often felt pity, he said, for a commonplace man bittered and spoiled, but described Downs as a nightmarish boss. Riley's letter suggests a pattern repeated elsewhere in the Guild, in which subordinate companions were forced to submit to authority uh, figures uh, who just went up to the job, who were unscrupu unscrupulous, untrustworthy, and so on. Um, and who, who were essentially inimicable to the Guild's own principles. According to Riley, Downs was offended that Riley wouldn't keep pace with him in whiskey drinking, uh, and by his refusal to join him in skimming money for the estate, uh, from the estate. He argues that, that an awful lot of, of money went into Downs's pocket. The principled socialist, Riley, and the reactionary gardener, Downs, made violent bedfellows, particularly as the latter neglected the estate and sent Ruskin unfavourable reports of Riley's conduct. Supported during the first phase of Potley, Ruskin, Ruskin became increasingly suspicious of working class uh, agency on his estates and imposed an authoritarian leader on Riley with disastrous results. He could have trusted Riley, I think, but didn't. Um, so there's a whole list of other grievances which we could talk about that, that, that Riley makes about Downs, but uh, we don't have time. Uh, according to Riley, uh, Ruskin's only visit to Totley came in October 1879 and heralded the end of the, um, of the, of the Guild's Totley estate. Um, this, this is um, Riley's description of why he, why he was chucked out, essentially. Just previous to his visit, Ruskin's visit, I'd hurt my back with digging heavy clay, and Ruskin told me to rest a while. After he left, I told the agent what Ruskin had said, and he replied, then I suppose you must rest. I rested for two days, and the agent complained of it to Ruskin, who sent me, through the agent, an open letter immediately uh, dismissing me in terms that were harsh and exceedingly unjustifiable. Ruskin claimed to Carpenter in 1880 that Riley liked smoking better than digging. But Riley's account now renders that claim moot, opening up an alternative reading that places blame on Downs for corruption and bad faith and on Ruskin for failing to investigate. One of the interesting things about doing this research is that there are all these competing stories and you have to try and weigh them up and in some cases you can't quite be sure. But um, the fallout from, from Riley's dismissal caused a terminal rift, essentially. A year after Riley was dismissed, Ruskin described him as the worst of all the blackguards I ever came into collision with in my long life. <laughs> so that's one side of the story. By uh, 1889, he was uh, still angry, claiming to, uh, uh, 
that Mr. Riley was no friend of mine, uh, although I tried him as an expo exponent of modern liberalism and was little pleased with the result. Riley, on the other hand, claimed that during 30 years varied and busy life, I have never, never been pained and deceived by any other person so much as by John Ruskin. And I write this after over eight years reflection. So the two sides of the story. The mutual bitterness is, is partly explained, I think, by the consequences of their parting. With Riley gone, Ruskin's hopes for uto utopian progress at Aberdale were entirely dashed, uh, while Riley confronted shattered ideals and poverty. When I was evicted from Totley, I was penniless, but Ruskin seemed to care nothing for that, he wrote. Uh, emigrated to Massachusetts in 1882, he died in 1907, having never really quite recovered from Totley. So that brought the, the second uh, phase to an end. Um, if Riley's account is to be believed, Downs was able to live out his days in drunken isolation, taking perquisites without Ruskin's oversight or Riley's irritating presence. Downs' solo management we know was certainly unprofitable. And, uh, and as Sally has pointed out, those who took over the estate in the late 1880s described it as a neglected wasteland. One of the Guild's trustees also appears to have been critical of Downs' management. Many accounts suggest that Totley's problem was poor land, but Pearson and Furness, who then took over the estate, transformed the farm into a thriving market garden with Pearson purchasing the uh, property from the Guild in 1929 and working it very successfully until his death in 1938. His, his success suggests that the United Friends were incompetent and Downs negligent rather than there being a problem specifically with the land. Ultimately, as we come to a close, we cannot verify or dismiss Riley's claims, but the pattern he claimed of, uh, of a failing central authority, of, of someone at the centre who just doesn't pay enough attention to what's going on in the estates, and of abuses of power by the people in charge of the estates, has echoes everywhere in the Guild's early history. What we find at Totley is also true, for example, at Bewdley in Worcestershire. Um, and there are, there are other cases uh, at Clout and Moor where similar things are going on. Uh, so as I've, as I've learned the scale of estate mismanagement and misery that attended the Guild's agricultural work, I uh, glimpsed the response of the companions in the late 1880s to the possibility of this becoming public knowledge. Uh, it's clear that the Guild's elite had vested interests in the misrepresentation and suppression of the lost companions and that this has hampered our understanding of experiments like Totley. Some of the most important sources have simply been uh, suppressed. Uh, others, others uh, we just have been a little bit far away for people to look. The long-standing interest of Totley residents, though, in this story, which I hope is, 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 isn't finished yet, and as we'll see in a moment as, as uh, Sally starts to talk about some of the things that she's been finding as a result of, of reading my book and, and having a look around the area, uh, I think this story, I hope, <coughs> of Totley will continue <coughs> and that many further discoveries um, are yet to be made. Thank you. You can see that as somebody who's mainly commissioned to uh, write a little performance about this, me thinking, my God, because it's, it's such a complicated story, isn't it? Um, and not always a happy one. Um, but uh, I suppose my interest in writing something like this is to find out who those people were. Mark's book was invaluable, but um, the more I looked, the more questions kept coming up again. Um, but I'm just going to, uh, yeah, you put, yes, here we go. I wanted to find out who these people were, first of all, the people that signed the agreement with Ruskin, the first lot of people. So uh, Dorothy over there has got great uh, skill in family history. So between us, uh, but with Dorothy doing most of the legwork, we found something out about them. And as you can see, none of them are bootmakers. Absolutely none are bootmakers. 
Edwin Priest is actually quite a local worthy, in fact. He's not only an optician, but he's a director of several small building societies. Building societies in those days were a means of actually people sometimes getting the vote, because if they got some land, they could, they could get the vote. And so he was a sort of liberal person. He was a Quaker, and he was a friend of Henry Swan, who started the Walkley uh, Museum. So I think in a way, I can't prove this yet, but I think uh, he was really the sort of go-between. When you look at, uh, I don't know what Mark would think of this, oh, yeah. but I think the, the name, the United Friends Association, it sounds like a building society, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think they were already paying money in because they wanted to do something. And then Ruskin comes along and Swan puts them in touch. So I'm not sure that he would have been a communard, in fact. I'm, uh, it's uh, impossible to tell. But we've got other people. Joseph Sharp and Mrs Malloy are people that Edward Carpenter talks about. Joseph Sharp was a musician, ex-chartist. Uh, we've got, they're all sort of skilled people. Henry Richardson employed several uh, people in his uh, Carver Fork uh, workshop. Um, so uh, there they are. But um, Louise at the Ruskin Gallery found me another um, document, which I haven't got up there, but it is on here. And I think it's written by Henry Swan because it's in a mixture of Pittman's shorthand, early Pittman's shorthand and handwriting. And he was into Pittman's, was Henry uh, Swan. And it's a, it says, applicants for shoe tuition. <laughs> so I think they wanted to be bootmakers but they needed teaching. And uh, the, the man at the top who's recording the names is a shoemaker, I discovered. So there we go. But anyway, what I'm now really going to talk about, ever so briefly if I can, is the success, <laughs> eventually, of St George's Farm and, uh, and Edward Carpenter's crucial role in that. So can we go on to the next bit? There's a blank slide and then we... There, there he is, in all his sandaled glory. Um, Edward Carpenter lived at Millthorpe, writer, semi-vegetarian, uh, kept his piano in the kitchen. He was a he was an upper class man from Brighton, ex uh, Cambridge curate who amazingly threw away his dress clothes and decided that he wanted to move to the north, live with working people. He was gay which was extraordinary because he lived uh, openly years later with his lover and wrote about gay politics at a time of the Oscar Wilde trial. A pretty brave thing to do. Anyway, he was a friend of Harrison Riley. He met him while he was on the farm and he used to come up and help. I found a lovely quote in Mark's book about that. So... Uh, so he's already at this time, he's up here, he's lecturing working men. It's like a sort of early version of the WEA. He's lecturing them. He's getting a bit fed up. He, he's meeting uh, some of his students who work on farms and he likes this outdoor work. He says, I love this outdoor work. I never mean to stop it. And uh, it sort of inspires, really, a bit later in the early 80s, his move to Millthorpe, building this house and running it as a sort of small holding. He even sells potatoes at Chesterfield Market. You know, it's, it's sort of unheard of, really. And unlike Ruskin, he had the common touch, although he was this upper class man. He, he you know, people loved him, I think, <laughs> in, in no uncertain terms. So could we just go on to the next one? Uh, this is uh, St George's Farm when it was called Parker House. That's why the early communists were called uh, the Parker House Association. And you can see... A, um, <coughs> well, let's just... This is... This track down here, if you know the track from uh, the Shepley Spitfire that goes up to Woodthorpe Hall, that's that. And you see St George's up there, Parker House. And its fields are there. These fields were part of the Totley Hall estate, but, and they still are, aren't they, um, those of you who <coughs> live in Totley? Uh, but there were three fields here. It's a very small uh, place, 13 acres. That's an 1876 map, when it, just before it's bought by Ruskin, still called Parker House. 
we go on to the next one. Uh, oh, I don't know where the picture's gone. There was a nice picture of Edward Carpenter on that, but it seems to have disappeared. Uh, this is quite interesting. He's living in Highfields, which is just being built at that time, you know, near Highfields Library. And he writes to Walt Whitman, the famous American poet who he's, he's been to see. In a month or so, I hope to be at work out in the country near here, at first on some land of Ruskins, but perhaps not for very long so. So he's thinking about it. You know, he's, he's, he's um, met Riley. He's got, he's been, uh, he wants to live with a scythe maker and his family, Albert Fernihoff, who's working and living on a farm at Bradway. Um, but he's looking around for somewhere to live with this scythe maker and his family because the cottage is a bit little. Uh, so he's writing, and it's, uh, this is quite interesting. You know, he's considering it. He doesn't live here, but he is considering it. Can we have the next one? Um, but he moves to Queen Victoria Road, uh, then called Victoria Road, and this is the house. I found it. It's called uh, Woodland Villas. Uh, I'm living with a man, the best friend I ever had. Uh, this is Albert Fernie, iron worker, scythe river, river, uh, riveter and his little family. He often says, I, I wish Walt Whitman would come over here. Below my window there is a wooded bank. That's still that little wood that's there. Uh, running down to some water and then the Derbyshire moors. So he's, you know, they're just starting to, this, these are the first houses to be built actually on Queen Victoria Road in the 1870s. So, you know, he's moved out, out not long after they've been built. He knows, he knows the farm, he's interested, he's met Riley there, he's moved to Totley, but he doesn't live here very long. He then moves back to Bradway with, uh, with Albert Fernihoff, but he's, he knows it round here, he walks round here, and of course, once he builds his house at Millthorpe, the way, the way to get there is from Doran Totley Station, which was opened in the 1870s, and to walk through that very path that, you know, from the Shepley Spitfire mm -hmm. up to Woodthorpe, Holmesfield Park Wood mm -hmm. and round. So he knows that really well. Can we have the next one? Um, Graham, the, the, the man who was very hard done by by Ruskin that Mark's been talking about, says, um, after Downs had, uh, had gone, the, the, the era that, Mark finishes with, Ruskin had let the place to a company of communists whose headquarters is another farm with quarry not far distant. You may know of this community. Its founder, John Furness, is a remarkable and noble kind of man. This is a picture of the farm. It's out sort of near Lineker, out that way. Uh, this is not them. This is, these are previous people. I found this picture actually on the internet. But um, Furness, John Furness, um, and George Pearson, who takes over St George's Farm, were great buddies. They were early radicals, early socialists. They quarried together. They rented a quarry out at Riverlin. And they, I think they were determined to... They, they got a farming background, quarrying background. They were determined to do something together. And Furness buys, uh, rents this farm from the Renishaw Estate in 1886. <coughs> And I can't prove it, but I think it's possible that Pearson might have gone in with him because other people, you know, from the research that I've done, other people were living there with him. And there's an account of Carpenter visiting uh, with Charles Ashby, the arts and crafts man, in 1886 and saying, oh, they were great, they were just like early Christians, you know, he thought they were, you know, they were living this communal ideal. Can we go to the next one? Uh, and Edward Carpenter says, St George's Farm has been put in the hands of another less voluble and more practical body of communists, John Furness, George Pearson and co. So it's very clear that he's putting them, them together, Furness and Pearson, but actually I'm not sure that Furness ever did anything here. I think this farm came up. Ruskin is 
uh, Carpenter recommends Pearson to Ruskin because he knows that he's looking for somebody to take it over. Riley's gone. Carpenter's trying to defend Riley because he's a friendly and thinking of living there himself. But eventually, um, after Downs has made such a, a mess of it, he recommends George Pearson to go in. Now, what I don't know, and I would love, because this, this pair, Furness and Pearson, they're such interesting men. You know, they were sort of working class men, but I extremely strong, practical men. And with a lot of experience of farming and a lot of experience of very, very hard work. And they liked working together. They'd quarried together. They may have been together at Moorhay in 1886. Pearson takes on St George's in 1887. Whether they intended to do it together, I don't know. It's quite interesting that both Graham and Carpenter say it's Pearson and Furness and co who take it on. But I, when Marlene Marshall was here in the Totley History Group, she went and got a, a, a family history from the Pearson family because, of course, they still run a market garden nearby up at up at Dronfield Woodhouse and uh, they make no mention of Furness uh, running the farm. They talk about the friendship and the work together before. So I don't know but it would be nice to think wouldn't it that there was still some sort of communal ideal going on there but we don't know. Uh, this picture is uh, George Pearson in the middle, the friend of Carpenter's um, and, uh, and the early socialist, and these are his sons. And this is taken about 1910. Can we just go on to the next one? Yes, this Pearson family um, thing that uh, we, we got from Howard Pearson up at uh, the, mar the Market Garden in Dronfield Woodhouse uh, says, you know, Downs <coughs> had made a right mess of it you know he just let it go in, into a state so it backs up what uh, Mark was saying and it was in such a state that the Guild of jo St George said he could have it rent free but there's this lovely family photograph taken outside St George's farm uh, that's uh, George on the right at the front his father <coughs> on the left his wife, Elizabeth, who was actually John Furness's cousin, so they were very close, and his sons and his daughter, Lucy, with the wonderful hat at the back. Shall we have the next one? And here she is. And uh, she's a Clarion Club cyclist. Now, some of you will know the Clarion Ramblers, those wonderful little books uh, um, of the Clarion Rambling Club, which was started in 1900, which was a, s the first so-called working class rambling group was started out of the socialist newspaper, the Clarion. And there were all sorts of things. There were Clarion choirs and lots of Clarion cycling clubs. And uh, Lucy was a Clarion Club cyclist with her wonderful bike. Look at that lamp on the front. <laughs> it's just great. And she lived at the farm until the 1960s, I, I believe. OK, the next one. And here he is, George, as an old man, a lovely picture with him with a little robin on his hand. Mm -hmm. I think he sounds like he was a bit of a curmudgeon, mind you. He was always falling out with his sons, and one of them actually went to join John Furness, who, who in 1902 emigrated to New Zealand. So he, he joined him. Uh, but they bought the farm, as Mark said, from the Guild of St George in 1929. So remember, they took it on in 1887. They're running it really successfully. All this stuff about it was rotten old land that Ruskin said is obviously tosh because he's made a, a real go of it. Um, they buy more land up at Dronfield Woodhouse that is still there now. And uh, in 1929, they buy the farm uh, and interestingly George is taken by one of his sons to visit the St George's farm, the Guild's farm at Bewdley so he's obviously interested still in that. Uh, his 
friend, Edward Carpenter, died that year, and I think it's interesting that he sent his very last letter to George. Mm. Um, but who, I, who I love those. Who did the one he go to? Who was the owner? Uh, the Guild of St George. Represented by? Well, the Guild of St George were like a sort of trustees, so, th you know, they're Not like Ruskin a... Ruskin No, no. Well, Ruskin is dead by this yeah. time. Right, can we have the next one? Uh, and uh, this is a nice stencil of, um, of the fruit boxes, which are still about. And in fact, Howard up at uh, Dronfield Woodhouse is going to find me a fruit box that still says that on it, still stores his onions in them. Uh, I think, have we got another one? Oh yes, do you know where this is? Here. It's here. On where we're sat, because they also bought uh, the Heatherfield, uh, what they call the Heatherfield nurseries. They bought this land here before this library or any of these houses here were built. Uh, although there were prefabs here, weren't there, in the after the war? Um, and this was a sort of retail arm because it was right next to Baslow Road. So we are now sitting on George. Pearson and Sons uh, nurseries here. So that's sort of brought it uh, forward and shown that, you know, Pearson was a reliable man. Uh, you know, Carpenter was practical in that he knew somebody who would run it well, um, could communicate with working people and indeed was friends with were friends with them, and uh, and that it was uh, that it was a real success. Um, what I just to explain what I'm doing with the performance is not necessarily finishing here. We well we do finish here. We finish back at the library, which is sort of a nice sort of circular thing. But we're trying to take in uh, this idea. You know, the early thing about the farm was. A you know, a miserable time, but the ideals behind it and some of those which carried on in what you, the, the stuff that Carpenter did, um, the stuff that even George Pearson was doing, but also other things that were going on in this area at the time. For instance, Carpenter was a good friend with Bert Ward, who was the Clarion Ramblers man. Um, and he was opening up this countryside round here for ordinary people to, to walk in. Uh, there was no national park at that time, a lot of the land you couldn't walk on. So he was doing that. He was also an early member of um, the uh, CPRE, the Council for the Preservation of Rural England, and with a marvellously sort of um, determined woman called Ethel Haythornthwaite, uh, he, he was involved in the very beginning of the CPRE and she in particular was very instrumental in getting the Peak District National Park and indeed national parks all over the country. So our walk will look at some of this landscape thinking about that and meeting some of those characters who carry forward this idea about land, who, who has access to it, who can walk on it, and and who can enjoy it. So, um, but we've only got how many tickets left? Five, I think. Five. It's it's five. five. Yeah. So <laughs> you'll have to <laughs> rush if you want any more. But there will be this event in October, where you can look at what we've found out. I'm sorry we've gone quite late now, but if there are any questions, and for me or Mark, and then we can have cake. <laughs> <laughs>